Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Laura Mullen, and on behalf of ACRL and Choice, I'd like to welcome you to today's program, The Everyday Importance of STEM, How Learning About Science and Technology Can Promote Success in All Aspects of Our Lives, sponsored by McGraw-Hill Education and featuring John Rennie, Editorial Director of Access Science. Today's discussion is one in a series of sponsored webinars from ACRL and Choice that addresses new ideas, developments, and products of interest to the academic library community. Free to users, these structured 60-minute live presentations provide the opportunity for interactive discussions of important new sh issues and developments in academic librarianship by librarians, vendors, authors, and other interested stakeholders. Before we get started, I'd like to point out a few features of the webinar software. In the main area of the screen, you can follow along with the presentation materials. Along the left-hand side, you will also see a Q&A panel that you can use to submit questions or comments. We'll spend some time responding to your questions during the program, so please do feel free to submit these throughout. And finally, please note that today's program will be recorded and all registrants will receive follow-up instructions on how to access the archived version. Our featured speaker today is John Rennie, who is the Editorial Director of Access Science, McGraw-Hill Professionals' award-winning online science reference. For three decades, he has worked as a science journalist, editor, and lecturer, including 15 years as Editor-in-Chief of Scientific American. He's also appeared on the Weather Channel as the host of the television series Hacking the Planet. Among the professional honors he has received are the Carl Sagan Award for Public Understanding of Science, bestowed by the Council of Scientific Society Presidents, and the Potomac Institute's Navigator Award for Distinguished Service in Support of National Science and Technology Policy. To help moderate our Q&A later in the program, you will also be hearing from Hillary Maybaum. Hillary is a former research oceanographer with 16 years of experience in educational publishing, particularly for the web. She has authored several textbook supplements and is currently senior online editor at McGraw-Hill Professional, where she oversees the day-to-day -day functioning of Access Science. At this point, I think we're ready to get things started. So take it away, John. Thanks very much, Laura. Hello, uh, welcome everybody. It's gratifying to have so many of you here joining us today as we discuss the everyday importance of education in science, technology, engineering, and mathematics, that cluster of fields most commonly abbreviated as STEM. Over this next hour, I'm going to speak a bit about the diverse ways that importance manifests itself, but I also want to talk about how we can use awareness of that importance and what it means to different audiences to help drive greater understanding of science and engagement with science. We want to try to share some insights into how to connect various audiences, and, and particularly students, with STEM learning uh, based on strategies that have traditionally been very successful in science communication. Uh, our hope is that some of these strategies might be valuable in helping you to overcome the challenges that you face in promoting STEM education at your various institutions. As you heard Laura say, I'm John Rennie, the Editorial Director of Access Science. Um, with me is Hilary Maybaum, the Senior Online Editor. Um, we'd love to know more about uh, who you are, too, uh, because that may help us in trying to direct today's conversation in, in more fruitful directions. Um, to that end, I really would encourage you to tell us who you all are, at least in aggregate, uh, using the poll that should be appearing there at the, the bottom of your, of your screen. I, as I can see, we've already got uh, a lot of people who've already replied, and uh, I'm not too surprised to find that a uh, great many of you are uh, librarians, particularly in uh, different educational settings. So good, that's, that's excellent to have. I know that information. Um, and you know, we really do want this to be a conversation, so please do feel welcome to use the webinar interface to ask questions during my presentation. Um, Hillary is going to be monitoring those questions as they come in and immediately texting back some kinds of answers to some of them as I speak. Uh, at the end of my talk, uh, she's going to pose some of the best of those to me, uh, and we'll discuss them aloud for everybody. Uh, so while while you're um, using the poll, um, let me, let me, I'm thinking of some sort of preliminary question, um, let me start to uh, briefly note just uh, 
sort of a 10,000 foot structure for today's uh, webinar. Um, I'm going to start by just briefly noting, again, why STEM fields are so commonly recognized as important, what that means, and the different forms that importance takes. Um, then we're going to go over some of the basic challenges that need to be acknowledged in any kind of STEM communication effort. And then we're going to turn to some of these time-tested ways of communicating STEM successfully, uh, including some well-known examples. Um, I, I think you'll see that the key for most of these involves a combination of matching the right STEM messages to the right audiences, and then also looking to promote lifelong, enjoyable engagement with science. So um, I'm, I'm going to start then um, by, by saying something that I am sure is in no way news to any of you, uh, namely that, that we live in an era of scientific discovery and achievement that is unrivaled in history. This is the golden age of STEM. Just, just look at some of what we've learned and done relatively recently through, through a combination of astronomical observations and fundamental physics. Science has deduced what happened in the earliest microseconds of our 13.8 billion year old universe and discovered that its expansion is driven by a mysterious dark energy that's the most abundant thing in the cosmos and yet somehow completely invisible to us. Uh, back in 1990, we were uncertain about the existence of any planets orbiting other stars. Today, we have confirmed existence of almost 1,800 of them, with thousands more known likely candidates in the wings. We've begun to scope out the, the innermost workings of living cells at the molecular level. Science has identified the precise sequence of nucleotides that makes up the genomes of humans and other organisms, and is in the process of learning just how our DNA both encodes and regulates the production of the proteins that make life possible. Engineers are routinely building skyscrapers and other structures that go far beyond whatever their predecessors once might have thought was possible. And of course, neuroscientists are making ever bolder forays into understanding in detail how the brain itself works, which could lead to extraordinary new treatments for rehabil rehabilitating or extending our minds and our memories. These examples are all just at the tip of the iceberg of what STEM fields have accomplished. And again, I know that you're all well aware of this, but it's worth pausing to note them because these are precisely the huge payoffs of STEM that so many people, particularly younger uh, students, may know little about or may little appreciate. And we want them to share in this as richly as possible. Of course, a big pay, part of this payoff of STEM, and it's the one that is usually used to underscore the, the importance of STEM fields, is the economic importance of them. Um, as the U.S. Department of Labor notes, for example, half of the sustained economic expansion that it foresees in the United States over the next few decades is going to come from growth of STEM fields, both in the share of the GDP those industries enjoy, um, but also the number of people employed in them. Now, this is despite the fact that jobs traditionally described as STEM jobs chemists, biochemists, engineers in uh, nuclear power and agriculture and material science and so on, uh, those employ really less than 5% of the workforce. And employment in those areas is projected to see some very good growth for years to come, particularly in comparison to many non-STEM trades. Um, so that 5% number is going to grow, and this is great news, especially since those jobs typically see a very healthy premium in salary, too, uh, at all levels uh, of educational attainment. But even those numbers uh, just may underestimate the real contribution of STEM uh, to the economy. Because a recent Brookings Institute study concluded that knowledge of science, technology, and math was crucial to a, to a large number of blue collar and technical jobs that are already not typically categorized as STEM. Uh, jobs like nursing, carpentry, automotive, and electrical repair. By that kind of reckoning, 20% of the jobs in the United States would already count as STEM, and the share of jobs that required STEM knowledge would have doubled since the Industrial Revolution. This infiltration of STEM knowledge into non-traditional STEM jobs merely reflects, I, I think, a more vital truth, which is that science and technology pervade all of our lives in countless ways, and the influence of these STEM forces gets bigger all the time. Every time we make healthcare decisions for our loved ones or ourselves, we're weighing options provided by STEM. 
Even the most Luddite among us can't avoid confronting new technologies that emerge and reinvent themselves constantly. We're, we're talking to artificial intelligences. Hello, Siri. Uh, we're working alongside robots. We're letting our cars parallel park themselves. We're deciding which of dozens of mobile phone options mesh best with the, with the rest of the devices we can't seemingly live without. Every time we step into a voting booth to determine the fate of an environmental initiative, we're drawing on our understanding of science, risk probabilities, and technological options. STEM is literally everywhere we turn and in everything we do. There's no reason to perceive this trend ending and, and no reason to think that those choices are going to get any easier. And that's the rub. All this scientific and technological progress is legitimately and literally wonderful, but the downside that goes with it is that it's extremely hard to keep up with it. Uh, you can see this in, in the scientific literature, where the number of new discoveries being reported each year just keeps going up. This graph shows the number of English language medical papers registered in the uh, medical data by database Medline each year. That's increasing at the rate of about 5% annually. Now, if that keeps up, and again, there's really no reason to think that it's not going to do that, then the number of medical papers uh, is added to MRN is, is, is going to actually jump from roughly a million today to twice that in only about 15 years. So we can speculate how tomorrow's physicians are going to be struggling to keep up, but we really have to worry how members of the general public are going to deal with this explosion of knowledge too. And given all of this, it's hardly surprising that students might find the job of keeping up forbiddingly hard. The amount of science to be learned, even at an introductory level, keeps expanding. And uh, notoriously, lots of students around the world are not managing to keep up. In the US, for example, we've talked a lot about this. Uh, there's been, has been very well documented and frequently lamented. There are not enough students reaching college with the requisite skills for STEM studies. Uh, only 44% of last year's high school graduates had the math skills to do college level work. Only 36% had the skills and knowledge to tackle college science courses. But I would say that these kinds of these kinds of educational disappointments reflect a problem that's, that's deeper than a simple failure to keep up with science. We may live in an unrivaled era of scientific discovery, but we also live in an era of public apathy, misunderstanding, and distrust of science. Um, it's very disappointing for those of us who you know, grew up in something like the, the Apollo space program era of, of public uh, attitudes towards science. But today you can see this in attitudes toward issues like climate change, genetically modified organisms, and the kind of imagined links between vaccines and autism. Uh, we see this in debates about future energy prospects and the teaching of evolution in public schools. So how do we help students and other members of the public overcome this? I mean, it's a, it's a formidably big question. And in the interest of formulating an answer, I hope you're going to indulge me if I back up a little bit and, and take a look at a very specific example, namely myself. How, how did I, as, as maybe sort of a, uh, a success story of sorts, how did I get involved in science? Well, um, behold, there you have uh, one of uh, my family's entry in the, the tragic family photo from the 1970s uh, contest that we all can have. Um, that's me toward the center, looking very stylish in my uh, white turtleneck and uh, with a jacket that has lapels you could land uh, an aircraft on. Um, uh, so I grew up in a family um, where, it, as it turns out, I grew up just like, like lots of other kids, I started off with the, uh, the usual interest in dinosaurs in space as a, as a little kid. But I also happened to have a very science-friendly family. My, my dad there on the left, he was a, a, a test pilot, an aeronautical engineer by training. My mother over on the right, she had uh, been a nurse. And so uh, partly because of that, um, our home was actually filled with lots of books that related to science. I, I grew up uh, sleeping beside a bookcase with this uh, set of encyclopedias just, uh, just within arm's reach. So as a little kid, I was always just reaching over and, and thumbing through those, uh, those, those kinds of books and exposing myself to all, all kinds of, of information, much of it scientific information. Um, I was also very lucky that they happened to have this 
this kind of, of uh, Time Life Library series. Um, many of you may actually remember this. It was a, a wonderful series of books, um, richly illustrated. And, and I was really, I was drawn into this and exposed to a lot of different types of science. Um, the, the kinds of photographs and illustrations and, and just the parts of the, the text that I could read and understand, this was very exciting to me, even when I couldn't really follow the larger picture of everything that was, was being said. The thing that really uh, perhaps cemented my attachment to science uh, actually happened roughly around the time that that picture that you saw before was being taken. When on a family vacation, uh, we happened to uh, stop in at a, at a little general store, and I was looking at the spinner rack of paperbacks, and I saw that there was a, this uh, very paperback you're seeing. It was a, an anthology of science essays uh, by the science writer Isaac Asimov, and I was absolutely enthralled by this. I, I, I was, I was just in love immediately with how fun it was to learn about the science and to try to explain about the science. And that uh, is what really then turned me on to, to further reading about the science. It, it moved me on to lots of other great books, um, some of my sort of classic authors, uh, and, and, and made me want to know more about the science and made me think that maybe I could have some sort of career involved in science in some way. Something else that certainly helped us along was the fact that in the, the small Massachusetts suburban town where I lived, Bedford, Massachusetts, there was a wonderful public library, and I could walk over to that public library and draw on the kinds of great science books that it had. Uh, it was very responsible in helping to, to develop me into someone who would then go on to college and study biology, and uh, later I did work at, at Harvard Medical School, and then, of course, have now pursued a life in, in science journalism using this, this kind of, of knowledge about the science in, in that way. I think if I start to reflect back on sort of what I try to, to draw out of, of my own experience from all of this, there are, there are a lot of things um, th that I think are, are sort of distinctive about that. One is that a, a lot of my experience was, was based on a certain kind of serendipity that was very easy and natural at the time, but m maybe much harder now. I was surrounded by books. It was easy to wander in and browse uh, in, in places like libraries. Uh, these days, where so many more of the, the references and, and works that people work with are, are digital in nature, it's a little bit harder for somebody in an undirected way to sometimes get to, to, to just uh, be exposed to some of those. Um, but I was also the beneficiary of a kind of, of great curation that was going on, starting with the, the, the books about science that happened to be in my home because of my parents' choices, and then later, one, later ones that were there in the libraries, uh, and, and the exposure that I was getting to that. And all of these were basically able to play off the kind of enthusiasm that I already had for the science. They, they basically nurtured that. So I think this really speaks, of course, to the very important roles that librarians and faculty and others can make in, in making available the right kinds of inspirational and informative references in shaping people into to ones who want to be involved you know, with science altogether and with helping them learn how in the course of, of their, their studies uh, how to take advantage of those references. In particular, the kind of central question, uh, or at least a methodology that works so well, which is to start with a reliable general, general science reference, one that you can approach when you don't know very much a subject, and then to use that to connect to deeper, more detailed, trustworthy literature thereafter. These days, that's a process that it's still possible, but, but it, it tends to be done, of course, in, in more digital terms. As we all know, the, the references of first resort for everyone are things like Google and the other search engines and, and things like Wikipedia. Um, these are, are, I would certainly give them credit for, for being marvels of the modern age uh, in, in, in many, many ways, but um, of course they do have problems. If you, for example, just go in and blindly search for certain terms in Google, there's a very good chance that a lot of the, the better information that you'll run into suffers the liability that it may actually take the form of various journal articles. And they'd be professional materials that are frankly too hard for most students to begin to understand. But that's only, of course, part of the problem. They, in, in trying to find more accessible materials, the, the place where most students will go is quite natural that they're going to end up in Wikipedia. Uh, and Wikipedia you know, is, is, an, is an amazing resource in many ways, but as we all know, the quality of the entries varies quite a bit. It can change rather erratically, and the authority for that, that information is often very hard to verify. Uh, it's possible for students to use something like Wikipedia uh, as, a, as a way of, of 
stepping into the deeper literature, but the reality is that a lot of students who do use something like Wikipedia, they may never bother to view those deeper, more authoritative sources. And that doesn't even get into the that, that issue of just uh, how questionable sometimes the information you may find there is. And here again, um, forgive the, the egotism of this, but my favorite example is that, as it turned out, I discovered it a while ago, I actually happen to have a Wikipedia page. Somebody created this without my knowing about it. Um, it's right in some ways, but the information is very incomplete. It doesn't, for example, mention that I've been working here at uh, McGraw-Hill Education for several years. Um, and uh, among the, the other interesting choices that were made that in terms of finding a, a nice profile picture uh, to show of me, although there are certainly ordinary pictures that could be used, they've decided to use this picture that someone found of me singing karaoke on a cruise ship in Mexico. So it's a little, it's a little different. Um, Nevertheless, the, the fact is that, that we, we do know that it, it is possible to encourage good, good STEM learning despite all these kinds of changes in this sort of informational landscape. Uh, and I think that some of the answers can be teased out of examples like mine about the best ways to do that. Um, going along with that, I think we also need to try to address these goals uh, within a STEM education of exactly what it is we think we want most students to know about what science is. Um, to my mind, that is that we want them to know that in part it is a body of empirically tested facts and ideas, but also we want them to know that it's a way of understanding the world a way of thinking about what it means when we say we understand something. I think we want them to know that real science depends on kind of ongoing critical scrutiny of contingent truths, that everything science knows is subject to revision in the light of newer, better information. And we also want them to understand the, the role of experts in this. Uh, we want them to understand the role of authority. We want them to understand that this is a dynamic process of discovery and reevaluation that guides science, and that the value of seeking solid scientific answers from truly qualified sources is there. In the same way that if you needed surgery, you'd want the help of a qualified surgeon, students should know that if they need scientific help, they should be turning to scientists with the right background. A lot of this then, you know, I think in, in a different time, we often talked about this in the context of the question about science literacy. And there's always a, a lot of debate about what indeed this, this much used term means, but a, a working definition of science literacy that, that I've become rather fond of is that science literacy involves helping people understand enough about science in a broad way that they will know how to find and make sense of more detailed scientific answers when they need or want them. Uh, this way of thinking about it skirts some of the problems of defining some kind of fixed canon of the essential science everybody is supposed to know. It also inherently promotes a level of ongoing science learning, which is the only way to keep up with ongoing discoveries. So with all this in mind, let me turn to some of these core principles that have been tested and applied successfully by the best science communicators over and over again. I think this is a good starting point for any discussion about how best to promote STEM involvement. Uh, and these principles might seem most relevant to those producing, writing, uh, uh, teaching materials uh, related to STEM. But I think it's also something that needs to be very clear, of course, to, to librarians and others who are selecting what materials to help make available, because those curation choices may help to guide success as well. All right. So it's place then to, to start is that there are three big challenges that confront all science or STEM communications. And they're challenges that exist even before we get into the specifics of teaching uh, the particular scientific information. Uh, those three challenges are, of course, of lack of interest, an excess of confusion, and conflicting priorities. Um, we, a lot of students are not necessarily going to be interested in any particular subject. Even ones who are may be confused by the, the information that we're presenting, and there is a problem that many of them, they might have some level of interest in learning what you're trying to te teach them about STEM, but they also have a lot of other things they would like to be doing. We need to anticipate, anticipate that these are the big obstacles in understanding and preparing, uh, understand, uh, need to anticipate that these are the big obstacles um, for anybody who's going to be trying to learn what we're telling them. And, and we have to try to prepare or choose educational works accordingly. So the, the bottom line here, as, as I explained to a lot of scientists and journalists that, I, that I've worked with or taught in communications, uh, is pretty much this. 
nobody needs to read about your stupid science. Um, this, this is maybe a principle that is less obviously true for scientists, or, or rather for students, because of course they, they are somewhat obliged to do the assignments. But it's important to bear it in mind anyway, because it affects how, just how likely it is that people will want to spontaneously prioritize uh, learning about STEM and view these kinds of resources that you're making available to them, and the likeliness that they will just do it of their, of their own free will. It's impossible to settle any of these problems and deal with these, these issues of interest and confusion and the priorities until you know your audience. Um, that is, you have to start to understand their specific information needs and their differing levels of innate interest or affinity for that. Um, we can certainly put that in, in terms of, of, of trying to understand this in, in the context of, of students. Um, you know, imagine uh, a giant introductory level lecture, lecture class. Uh, for a STEM subject. Um, we can start with that smallest circle you've seen drawn here, um, the, the STEM majors. Um, and then, by the way, none of these circles is, of course, meant to be drawn to scale in any way. The smallest circle just is, is the is size relative to the others is, is somewhat arbitrary here. But uh, that smallest circle is for those science majors who are really working in their own area. So these are the students who are, in most respects, going to be the easiest ones to address your STEM messages to, because they already have an intrinsic interest in the subject, they already may have some background in it, and they already have more specific motivation to read the materials and study hard and use the resources you give them. Uh, basically, they're already sold on this. They're, they're easy to talk to, um, relatively. Um, in contrast, look at that biggest circle, the one that consists of these, these non-science majors. They're, they are the ones who are, to, we can think of them as almost STEM-averse. They are only there in many cases because distribution requirements are, are obliging them to be there. Um, in any particular STEM class, now these may really be a minority of the, of the students, but they are, of course, most representative at most institutions of that larger share of students overall. Um, you know who these people are. They're the, they're the kids in the back of the room who are fiddling with their phones all the way during the lectures, and they're not doing the reading they can avoid, and they're asking whether subjects will be on the final exam, and not engaging with the subject at all if they can possibly avoid it. Now, sadly, the reality is most of these students may really be, in practical terms, beyond your reach. Um, you, we can try to, to teach them, but they'll almost never be deeply enthusiastic about the science on their own. And the more efforts you make to win them over, you have to be aware that of just at what point you reach a, a point of diminishing returns, and whether there's a, a, a contrasting danger that the more you try to get them, the more you may also lose the potentially more dedicated students. And that's what brings us to that middle circle. That middle circle is for the, the science majors who are, are outside of their area, or these kind of STEM curious non-majors, um, the ones who have some kind of native enthusiasm for science even if they're not really committing their lives to it, they represent a really sweet prospect. They are already somewhat interested, um, maybe to their own surprise, in, in what they're learning. So if you can break down the barriers that stand between them and even a little bit more engagement with the science content, you may be able to cultivate a larger number of students with a healthy interest in science that will survive beyond the duration of any particular class. And moreover, I would say that these may be the students who are most susceptible to being informed or reminded about how STEM is important to them, to how it can or will figure in their careers or their personal lives or the lives of the people around them. That is the real point of leverage you can use with them. If all else fails, that is the relevance to them and their lives. In choosing or crafting these messages, it's very important to meet the audience that you know you're addressing on its comfort level and on its preferred terms. Now, a lot of times when, when this idea is presented, uh, it gets uh, criticized as being a form of dumbing down the science. But it has nothing to do with dumbing down science. It, it's about avoiding unnecessary obstacles to learning. You know, the fact is scientific language is difficult, and it's growing ever more so. The, this is a paper uh, from uh, 1992. It's fascinating. It, it looked uh, at the lexical difficulty scores of different uh, scientific papers and uh, the general uh, uh, writing for the general public. Uh, and, and basically, it, it showed in, in fairly empirical terms just how it is that, that scientific papers 
are getting more complicated and harder to read very rapidly, really starting back around 1970 or so, you started to see a, a fairly distinct increase in, in how, uh, how much more difficult a lot of scientific papers were becoming. That may have a lot to do with the rise of molecular biology during that time. Um, those kinds of scientific materials are the gap between them uh, and a lot of more general reading matter is only getting wider all of the time. It's also something that makes this very complicated is that, uh, is that scientists and the general public uh, frequently also use some of the same words and they use them to different effects. Um, one very well-known and, and obvious example of this is the word theory. When, when scientists are using the word theory, they're using it to describe some state of scientific understanding of a topic. Um, but when a lot of the public hears the word theory, to them, uh, they, they understand that to mean something that's only a hunch or a speculation, um, something that is very, very uncertain and not very well supported. So the word theory to most members of the public, and therefore to a lot of students when they're starting off, uh, really means almost the opposite of what it does in, in scientific terms. So when we're putting together these, these scientific choices, it's very important to pay attention to the language that, that would be used. Um, similarly, it's very important, in, and this does involve a, a deep understanding of, of who your audience is, of having to choose the right level of explanatory detail and difficulty. If you have too much detail, even in the service of explanation, it's going to be overwhelming for a lot of audiences. And rather than helping them to understand it, they're just they're going to feel crushed by it, and they're going to be driven away from the science and, and their desire for it. If there's not enough information, though, if there's not enough explanatory detail, then it's frustrating in a different way. And the, the students are constantly left having to ask questions. Well, why is this the case? And why is this the case? And if there isn't an easy way for them to follow up on that, perhaps by having tiered presentations of, of, uh, of the discussion on a subject, then, then they will feel frustrated by the science for those reasons. So it's very important to choose that right level of explanatory detail. These days, um, you know, it's also very important to be aware of the, the, the right medium for conveying uh, this sort of information. As we all know, the more and more people are, are uh, very interested in trying to get information delivered to them uh, by things like phones or tablets. Uh, so it's very important that a lot of, sort of, of digital or online resources be tablet and phone friendly. That said, uh, certainly our experience at Access Science has been still that when people are doing serious research and serious work, they are still largely dependent on things like laptops and desktop computers. So it's just important to understand that this, these patterns of use are constantly changing. And as they change, we need to be able to, to respond to that. Uh, it's also an enduring, enduring principle of, of human nature that people respond to people. Um, I, I think this speaks to the value of personifying presentations about science whenever it's possible and allowing a voice um, to this. Uh, it's useful to be able to present science as the product of, of scientists striving to solve problems, to show that there was a human story beyond simply the, the scientific exposition that is involved. One of the other things that can happen by doing this uh, is, is that it also can be in service to, to trying to promote diversity. Um, using lots of examples of, of women and people of color involved in science is smart. And it's not so much because of they are maybe presented as role models, but simply as a way of, of telegraphing the, the inclusiveness of the scientific enterprise uh, along those lines. Visuals. I had mentioned how important it was that the, you know, the, the, the amazing photographs and illustrations that I was seeing in books as a little kid, uh, how much that did to make me want to go back. And, and great visuals are something that has always uh, been very, very powerful for conveying points. The right kinds of, of infographics can draw people in and aid their understanding very powerfully. At the very least, though, you want to have a pleasing presentation just in general aesthetic terms because unpleasant ones will drive people away in all sorts of ways. Uh, we also know that people like to get information, um, sometimes certainly on, on a first presentation, they often like to get it in terms of videos and animations. That's a, a very popular way uh, for, for a, a lot of science to be learned these days. Sometimes deeper study involves um, being able to, to look at accompanying texts uh, that go along with that, but the videos and animations can be very useful for, for first winning people over into a field. 
understanding the type of science presentation that your that your audience wants at that particular moment is is really basically the key to to all of this. Um, some types of scientific presentation should be more in depth. Some can afford to be by design uh, more shallow, but specifically designed to just try to win over people's engagement. Um, there's sort of a term of art that a lot of science writers use. They talk about it as, as a kind of cabinet of wonders approach. And you see some good examples of this. Um, the, the, the Cosmos series is, is one that I think is great. Both the, the one from the 1970s, the original with uh, Carl Sagan, and the more re recent one that's on television these days, uh, with the astronomer Neil deGrasse Tyson. Uh, in both of these cases, these are, are programs that are doing a wonderful example of using great graphics and well-paced television, very strong visuals uh, to be able to, to present a lot of information about science, to tell very broad, overarching stories about science without a lot of specific depth into any one of them. Uh, it's not to criticize the, the depth of, of what's there. It's just that the function of these programs is to win people over and make them want to explore more into the science on their own. As such, it also does a lot to exploit the charisma of the hosts, um, of both of Carl Sagan originally and, and Neil deGrasse Tyson uh, these days in the modern version. Um, another program less well known, but that I think that did a wonderful job recently on the American public uh, broadcasting was a series called Your Inner Fish uh, by the biologist uh, Neil Shubin. This one was just connected to helping people understand uh, uh, evolution and specifically how a lot of evolutionary features that you could find in human beings have their uh, origins inside uh, different other kinds of animal life and, and how that can illuminate uh, the, the story of how it was the, the, we evolved and how evolution works in general. Um, so these are great for being able to help to win a lot of of, of people over, especially if they are, are new. People look for sort of an introductory level. This level of approach works very well. But uh, certainly a lot of students and professionals may need something that's more substantial, too. They may need something that, that uh, is, has more, a more immediate substance. Um, they need to feel, in that case, that the effort they put into engaging with the resource at hand is one that's well and quickly rewarded with whatever kind of answers they have. Um, that was actually was, was very important to us in taking shape of the program that uh, Hillary and I work with, which is uh, Access Science, which is, of course, is, is McGraw-Hill Professionals' uh, general online science reference. Um, this is carrying on a tradition of, of uh, more than 60 years from the McGraw-Hill Encyclopedia of Science and Technology. Um, for this product, this is something that when, when we were thinking about how to try to make access science good, we had to take all of these kinds of considerations uh, in, in, into account. Um, we wanted it to be a strong, useful digital reference that, that would be a first stop for people to make when they were searching for answers about science, but not necessarily the last stop if they needed much more detailed answers. And we wanted them to have a great feel of confidence in, the, in what they would find in access science. Um, so in, in the spirit, really, just as an example, let me just review a couple of the things of, of, of what we're doing at Access Science to try to show how we've used this trite of thinking and, and how that's sort of tried to shape the, the, the product in, in our case. Um, for one thing, it, we, we do try to point out this intrinsic fascination of science. We know that a lot of our users are students. We want them to be won over to science. So we, we start off with, even on our homepage, about, about trying to uh, play up a number of fascinating, noteworthy, appealing kinds of science. One part of that is a, is a sort of game-like feature that we have called Do You Know uh, that poses a question and, uh, and then elaborates more on that. So for example, uh, how does the chocolate flavor develop from the seeds of a cocoa tree? And then we provide them with links so that they can explore that more uh, if, if they would like to know more. But this, of course, is no, you know, this is definitely the icing on the cake. You know, the major reason for why anybody would come to something like, like Access Science uh, would be that they, they are there for the weight of this, these more than 8,400 major articles on all scientific subjects uh, that, that are available. These articles, they're ones that are expert authored and expert reviewed and edited by professionals like, like Hillary and aware of exactly the kinds of principles that, that we've been uh, discussed in the presentation. So we work with those experts to update the articles on, on a basis that's been regular in the past and is now ongoing. Um, it, it's important to us in, in presenting this kind of information, because we know that's what, what our users are looking for, we, it's important that that, the, that kind of value and the credibility of the articles um, be very clear right away. So we try to make sure that, for example, that the, the authors' names and their affiliations are listed right up front so people can, can see why this is an article that might be trusted. 
we try to use uh, very uh, good illustrations, figures that will help to, to uh, clarify the information. And we know that, that in terms of helping to promote that, that deeper exploration, when someone goes to a page on any particular topic, we have a sidebar presentation uh, for links to other related content um, so that people can, can go deeper into the content in, in that way. The information is all footnoted with different sorts of bibliographies and additional readings, and these include the DOIs for the technical journal literature. So if an institution uses the open URLs and just their click away from getting to go to those papers themselves directly. Um, we feel this is very important because, we, again, we want access science to be a portal in this way to that deeper exploration. That's what we want, how we want people to use it. Um, for the reasons we talked about before, we have understand the, 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 the value of videos and video biographies and different sorts of, of themed images of galleries. We, we use those to drive engagement for, for all the kinds of reasons that we talked about. We also know that the major way that anybody's going to be engaging with any of this sort of content is through search. That's when, when they show up at Access Science, they have questions in mind. They have specific things they want to look up. So we've tried to make sure that the, the search capabilities of the site are very strong. Um, so that, that uh, when they come with a question, um, we try to make sure that they, they're going to get the answers that they want. They're going to get uh, strong, immediate satisfaction. Um, so that, for example, that if they search for a particular term, most of the time people searching uh, what they want is just a definition of a term. And so if definitions appear at the very top of any search, uh, the rest of the listings are, are presented in order of their relevance to that term, and it's possible to, to screen through that information to filter it by particular types of presentation or particular subject matter. Um, this is what we think is, is not just valuable, but really essential for trying to make uh, access science as, as useful as it can possibly be for uh, the students who come to us. The, the bottom line here is that in all these cases, we're trying to anticipate what the user's needs and the expectations and their expectations about those, and then we want to meet those. Ideally, we want to meet them before they even have to ask about it, because we, we understand what their needs are so, so very, very clearly. Um, and we know that, that user uh, User experience online is extremely important. These days, people, especially online, they expect immediate satisfaction. So it becomes that much more important that the immediate user experience that they have uh, with Access Science be, be very gratifying. I don't want to just use examples of, of, of Access Science, so I wanted to, to just briefly touch on some of the, the other uh, great things that are out there. Um, one that's fascinating, um, you know, it's, uh, it's, a resource that, that uh, many of you are already uh, familiar with, I'm sure, is the Encyclopedia of Life. This is a, a very ambitious kind of wiki project that provides full taxonomic and, and life history information uh, about the full tree of life. Uh, the information is generally first uh, supplied by various experts and then curated by other biologists. Um, it, it's, it's really it's, it's quite a wonderful resource. Some of the curation does get a little spotty at times, but the site gets very good marks from the biologists that I've spoken to, and it's a very good starting point for further research into the natural history of various animals and plants, simply because it, it, it tends to be so complete and because the, the layout of information is, is very sensible and very immediately useful. Um, I'm sure some of you are also uh, acquainted with Gale's Science in Context. Um, this is a, a, certainly a very polished general science reference. It serves as, as a good interface for connecting students with a, a range of content in all of the Gale Cengage portfolio of science work. So there's a lot of information that uh, one can reach, um, again, on sort of a full range of, of scientific and technical subjects uh, through, through that. Um, uh, my, uh, my own history, I, of course, involved with Scientific American. Um, this, is, of course, is something that's long been involved in an in interesting position of, of straddling both the popular and special uh, presentations. Uh, it too is expert written, um, uh, and it often the articles have a considerable amount of, of depth to them. Um, what's interesting is that it, it succeeds with these kinds of long articles written for the general public by using a particular storytelling structure or a formula that, that's really very well suited to conveying scientific explanations with a lot of uh, context and history and, and explaining the relevance and highlighting the fascination of different sorts of, of problems. Um, 
Scientific American Long Just a Magazine. Now it's also a very robust online presence. And uh, it's, actually, it's very interesting. Recently, they put their whole archives. Uh, Scientific American is the oldest continuously published magazine in the United States. Um, they just recently put uh, online their whole uh, digital archives uh, going back to 1845. So you can scan really the uh, full development of science uh, since that time. Um, the, these days, of course, there's sort of a golden age of science communication. There is a rich science blogosphere that also needs to be acknowledged. Um, lots of wonderful communicators out there who are, are, are upholding the best principles of journalism and scholarship in their kind of careful investigations and presentations of new science. And sometimes they're not so new. They go back to, to older things and, and are very illuminating on that. I'm just going to mention a, a couple of great people in that area. Uh, one is named uh, Brian Sweetek. Uh, he does a, uh, a blog called Laylaps that is done on National Geographic site, and he does a stupendous job of covering paleontology and helping to put a uh, new information and perspective on different sorts of extinct life. And uh, then I think also somebody else that I really love is is uh, Marin McKenna, who does a blog called Superbug for Wired. Um, she is absolutely brilliant in the, her coverage of infectious disease matters, and particularly on the emergence of new infectious illnesses and uh, the rise of antibiotics resistance. And, and problems with food safety. Um, there also is, of course, is, is a lot of great ex science explanatory video, too. Um, and, and just again, to single out one uh, great entry in this area, uh, Minute Physics is, is seen, I think, by a lot of people as really sort of the, the, the cream of a very rich cop, uh, crop. Um, they do a lot of short, animated, uh, very charming, approachable explanations uh, about a lot of different subjects, mostly physics, but, but some other, uh, other areas. And these work for students and also the general public. They get high marks from experts for a lot of their, their, their cogency this way. I think it's worthwhile to point out all of these sorts of resources because you know, it, it's, it's one of the most important virtues that we should be, um, that, should, that should be implicit in all of our good science references is that they don't exist in isolation. They're not from one another and not from this ongoing dynamic process of scientific investigation. Scientific information shouldn't present, be presented as, as some kind of fixed, embalmed set of facts under glass. There's constant reevaluation and testing. No fact, no experiment, no body of knowledge is, is complete in itself, and no expert speaks as the eternal final authority on any problem. Students need to be exposed to the best information available, but they also need to be exposed to this questing dynamic at the, at the heart of STEM fields, the dynamic that's ultimately responsible for all those great benefits accruing from science and technology. And indeed, I think this lesson about everything influencing everything else isn't just a truth about science or about the literature of scientific information. I think it's, it's really it's, it's a truth about the universe as a whole in which vast principles unite the cosmos and grand effects from small causes can play themselves out over millions and billions of years. And discoveries in our world can inform understanding of, of what's happening at the far end of the galaxy. This is the fascination and the grandeur of science and other STEM areas. And I'd submit that teaching students this is the important truth that, that is in some ways the greatest knowledge with which we can leave them. And having said that, uh, I think let me let me turn things over for more questions um, to to Hillary. Um, and would you what, what what are some of the, the fine questions that uh, the people have been asking here today? Okay, John. Well, we've had a number of questions, and even more are coming still. We have a great question from Roxanne who asks, "How would you tell students to evaluate science blogs?" Oh, great for evaluating science blogs. I mean, I think you know. Uh, it's a great question. I, I think that, that a lot of the, the kinds of traditional terms for evaluating any kind of paper and scholarship are relevant. Um, I, I think the science blogging community, there is a real, uh, a, a genuine community of online science writers. Um, uh, they, they worked a lot to sort of police themselves this way and try to raise the, the general standards. And, and among them um, is where it's that it, uh, a lot of things they do is that they try to observe uh, the sorts of customs of, for example, um, adding the full citations uh, to, the, uh, to the work that they're doing. 
when they're describing papers that people should be able to quickly see what the citations for those papers are going to be. Um, having a good useful links that go off to the general literature or other related useful commentary, that I think is seen as good form. Um, but a lot of the, you know, for, for evaluating science blogs, the same rules apply as for any other kind of presentation of science. Is it is it engaging? Does it, does it make you want to read it? Do you understand it? Is it clear? Is it well informed? Uh, does it answer the questions that, uh, that, that you, the, the reader, uh, have as you go into the, the, the article and that you find yourself asking as you're going through it? Does it anticipate that you want answers to those? And does it present all of this in, in, in an appropriate level uh, of presentation in the ways that I was talking about, such that, that you don't feel overwhelmed, but that you maybe feel like you know how you would continue your exploration of the subject if you wanted more? Those are all the kinds of things that I would say for, uh, uh, for, for trying what people should be aiming for. Great, John. Thank you. I have another question here from Sue Kiefer. She says, do you have any suggestions for science manipulatives or toys that we could use in our libraries? Oh, that is a great question. I have to admit, as I live my constantly print-bound life, I'm not sure that I have the, the, the best uh, set of, uh, of suggestions immediately to think about um, or to something to be able to suggest in that way right off. Um, I mean, I guess a, a good place to start with that, I would wonder, would be to look to what a lot of the, the science museums and technology centers around the country, um, a lot of them where they have gift shops, this is something that they have obviously given a lot of attention to. I, I don't want to be just sort of to be shunting you off in the direction of their commerce, but they are people who obviously have given a lot of, of attention to this more, I have to admit, than, than I immediately have to be able to suggest right off. But some of their offerings um, might, be, might be very good uh, as, a, as a good tip for those things. Okay. Uh, we have another question here from Team Services at Memphis Public Library. Uh, they ask, what are the strategies found most useful in attracting teams to STEM programming across the country? Mm. Um, yeah, that's a great question because obviously teams are that, that sort of that, that, that perfect set. These are the people who are really making a lot of decisions about where they want to go and this is in certainly this is a, a time when sadly we lose a, a lot of of uh, young women um, from from science and, and a lot of other people who start end up being underrepresented in science. I, I think that the, the, uh, there's probably a lot to be said about this, but I think that a lot of it comes back to just some of the, the, the core principles I talked about before. One is try to, to make it clear that the science is itself fascinating and valuable and that it is something that uh, – that, that human beings can, that they engage in this and that they um, can very happily engage in this for, for a lifetime. I think what's bad is if people just come away with a bad sense of science being horrible drudgery and something in which they cannot picture themselves having any fun doing this. Um, I think people who are involved in science, they, they love it. They love the work. They love the discoveries and they love the, everything about it. I think trying to show that Science and technology that these and mathematics too that all of these are uh, that, that all of these are fields uh, that that can happily engage people. Um, I, I think if if we make the evidence of that clear, a lot of these young people will find where they can and how they can happily fit themselves within it. Okay, thank you, John. Um, we have another question from Karen Murray who asks, what activities can I present in a library setting to stimulate an interest in science? Oh, great, great subject. Um, again, I, I would not want to present myself too much as an expert necessarily about, about what would work best in, in a library setting, but I think that this is something, you know, I'll, I'll throw off some things um, offhand that I, that I think might be fun, and you can be the judge of whether they'd be appropriate. Um, I think that anything that would, would encourage a kind of level of discussion, um, I think that, that anything where people would be, if you, if you could find ways to uh, identify, say, a piece of, say, science news um, recently or, or any kind of scientific discovery that people thought was fun and just find, you know, sort of uh, challenge them to 
to to read up on it and do like a little presentation to other members of a group, basically a kind of little um, you know science salon of that sort. I think encouraging some kind of discussion that way um, could be great, and asking maybe maybe. Um, identifying what could be a large, uh, potentially large, complicated topic, and have have people, you know, in that spirit of the the various the the blind men feeling their way around different parts of an elephant, um, have somebody talk about the history of a particular problem. Have somebody talk about some recent new discoveries that were coming in on a particular problem. Have somebody talk about like technological applications of something that maybe was um, a, a discovery in, in basic basic research uh, terms. Um, I, I think that that I think that anything you could do that could connect up people's natural lives with scientific discovery will help to bring a lot of these fields alive. Excellent. Um, I have uh, a comment here. It's not so much of a question, but um, I shared it with the audience. It's from Elon University. I hope I'm saying that correctly. Mm -hmm. um, and they say, how about suggesting maker spaces for those wanting toys and hands-on science in libraries? Oh, that is such a great suggestion. Thank you so much. Yes, one of the really exciting, wonderful developments in recent years has been the rise of the maker movement. Um, you know, the, this, I, this notion that so many people are now, um, after we've gone through you know, so many decades of, of, of so many of us just being kind of on the receiving end of a lot of different sorts of technology, they're going back to the roots of, of making things. And uh, these days, it's astonishing the kinds of things that it's possible uh, to make and the kinds of, of projects one can do. You know, we We've seen how how ro robotics is something that now is is you know there are there are child's toys based on robotics and 3D printing is, is an amazing area um, that that it, it's fascinating to be involved in in the subject of how you can be just producing these things but I think increasingly we're going to see 3D printing as 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 an amazing amazing capability where people will in the future in effect be able to download different sorts of of objects from the internet they get the plans from that they plug that into uh, what may be their home's 3D printer and they be may be able to make different types of objects on demand. There are great projects of this. And uh, you know, I, I, I attended uh, the Maker Fair uh, out in, in New York City last summer, and it was, it was a wonderful time. And I saw great examples of, for example, uh, people demonstrating uh, quadrotor uh, flyers uh, and being able to then engage with the students and teaching them things about angular momentum and how it was that you made something that has, uh, has, has has uh, a rotor uh, at each of its four corners. How do you make it turn various ways? How do you make it bank? How does it? How do the aerodynamics of that affect? Yeah, that's that's a great idea. The maker, the maker fairs, and uh, all the kind of the the, the, the maker movement in general, uh, rich with great capabilities of helping uh, uh, to to bring a lot of different scientific principles alive. Thank you, John. Your um, answers are spawning ever more questions, and I'm afraid we only have a few more minutes <laughs> to share. Um, but I will ask a question um, from Lawrence Gould, who says, how can you one introduce students into valid arguments that challenge the mainstream views about climate change? Mm, well, uh, I think that's a good question about what, what exactly that would mean. Um, but I think that, that you know, climate science is an is in, in ongoing area, and it's filled with a lot of, of discussion and scrutiny of new work. Um, the, broad, the broad outlines of what's happening with climate change are sadly rather solidly, uh, solidly supported at this point we're about what anthropogenic uh, warming is, is actually is doing to the earth but there's still an enormous amount of detail that still needs to be filled in about exactly what the about what the the, the specifics about about how bad certain things may be or what, what the consequences of certain changes might be. Uh, moreover, I think there's a, a lot that, that in terms of trying to develop what are the appropriate responses. This is something that goes beyond just the discussion of the science. It also goes back to the much larger, more complicated areas of policy that do uh, plug into a lot of different sorts of areas of human activity. So, you know, there are a lot of questions um, that, that one can raise and that one can explore um, without necessarily rocking the what would be seen as the, the, the mainstream or of, of, of climate science that way. I think that, that climate science is very open to lots of new ideas uh, and, and we, heaven knows it looks like we could use them. Thanks, John. We have time for just one more question and I apologize for those who won't get their questions answered during this particular session. Um, but Ellen Stringer asks, 
you to please talk about the overlap of science and art or STEAM education. Oh, that's great. Sure, happy to do that. And let me just say for the benefit of anybody whose questions I don't get a way to answer, um, you should be seeing online that that's my email. Um, you're very welcome to shoot me an email if you like, and I'll, I'll try to answer as many questions as I as I can. Um, um, STEAM education, yes, uh, right. The involvement of the arts, I think that's great. Obviously, there is a rich component of uh, what science and mathematics can do in both the creation of extraordinary, beautiful new works of art, and also in ways in which uh, art can illuminate a lot of the principles of, of, of what's happening in science. Um, this is, is such a big area, I, I can't obviously do too, uh, begin to do justice to it in, in just the, these few seconds, but I really it is something that I would explore, and I think it's a great area for being able to, to use that as a way of drawing in people who, for example, think of themselves as uh, humanities people and don't think of themselves as, as, you, as being involved in science, but being able to show how that, yes, the science is relevant to both the creation of new art and how the art can illuminate some things about the science itself. The ways, for example, that different sorts of optical illusions, you know, the sorts of, of, of uh, visual effects in art can tell us a lot of profound things about how the visual system of the brain works just to choose that one. Um, I, I think this has been so great to get a chance to talk with all of you. I'd encourage you to um, shoot me a line if you'd like. And Laura, let me turn things back over to you to wrap things up now. Thank you very much. Great. Thank you, John. Well, it looks like we are ready to wrap up our time together today. I'd like to give a virtual round of applause to John and Hillary for spending time with us and sharing some great info. We really appreciate your insights. Just as a reminder, we have recorded today's program, so be on the lookout for a follow-up email from ACRL and CHOICE that will include instructions on accessing the archived version. Thanks again to our participants for joining us. I hope you 